Hello friends, I'm Shenanigoon, and this is Tiny Tina Wonderland's challenge to only use magic and melee weapons, no guns. This is a fantasy game which has the addition of guns because as Tina says... You're in Tina's fantasy, baby! But I want to see if you can beat the story without ever using a gun, only making use of spells and a big old honk and blade to the face. The only rule is, never fire a gun. Fair warning, this is a full playthrough of much of Tiny Tina's Wonderland, so if you don't want spoilers, you'll likely want to click away. Now let's do this thing! First things first, we choose intense difficulty, because just like life, if I'm gonna only do this once, then I want it to be as intense as it can be. Next, we watch as Queen Butt Stanley and does her, does her best Dark Souls impression and traps the Dark Lord. Now that the end boss is defeated, time to start character creation makes perfect sense. As someone who's going to rely on spells mostly, the class Spellshot is the obvious choice, as it literally has the word spell in the name. I make my most beautiful character yet, name her Strawberry because all the red, and not because I'm attracted to the fruit. You can't prove a thing. I pop in a bean and get straight to work grabbing my first weapon, a woodcutter axe that will never touch wood again, but lots of bone instead. I follow some ghostly hoof prints to the first gun of the game, the crossbow. I equipped it, but I have no intention of using it. I just, I don't know how to unequip it. I get into my first fight and bash bones pretty easily. After, I take a second to remove the crossbow, then with a heart full of courage and a brain full of nothing, smash some explosives with my axe to progress on. Thankfully, I have some pretty tough skin and on I go. I clear the village, make it deep in the castle, and collect my first spell, the ability to pelt others with ice. Which is something I can already do in real life too, but I guess the wand is what makes it magic? I then confront the first boss of the game, Upper Management Skeleton. The manager has a lot of magic, and like a big jerk, he won't just stand there and let me kill him. So I'm forced to jump around a lot and pelt him with some ice whenever it was off cooldown, while hitting him as much as I can. Halfway through the fight though, I get downed, and since I have zero idea what a death save is, I settle for crawling up and begging for my life. Not very heroic, I admit, but it was worth a shot. He kindly waits for me to return instead of going through with his ritual, and this time I crush him with ease thanks to actually showing caution. Game needs a big bad though, so the Dragon Lord is freed regardless of my victory, and I'm forced to give chase across the overworld, where my head has grown in proportion to my ego. I reach Brighthoof, the capital of this world, and find it under siege by an undead army. While I'm tempted to turn around and pretend I saw nothing, I realize I'll get no loot that way, so I charge ahead to save the city. At this point, I meet Paladin Mike, a cool fella, I'm sure, but I am far too focused on getting loot than listening to him. Well, whatever he said, it leads us to both fighting to take back the city, seduce a drawbridge naturally, and reunite with the unblinking, eerie Queen Butt Stallion. That disturbing unicorn has me follow her to a secluded graveyard in search of a mystical sword, though I'm 95% sure it's to murder me. Her nefarious plan is ruined when we are attacked by the undead. I do have to wonder though why she hid the most powerful weapon in this world in a graveyard when her arch nemesis the dragon lord is all about necromancy and the undead. But hey, it's just the world, whole world at stake after all. I go down to a harder skelly archer but I've learned something the Jedi wouldn't tell you, how to stop myself from dying. I fight the zomboss and while she's pretty annoying, I'm even more annoying. Engaging in hit and runs with my spells and my trusty blade, I claim victory. I then use the power of the Lich King to steal her soul and head back to town. Not quite as sure that I'm on the good side. The queen makes statues of me everywhere for saving her city instead of seeing to the health of her citizens. A sign of a great queen, I'm sure. I'm not the only one who is not the biggest fan of her majesty, but the dragon lord takes it a bit too far and tries to turn this unicorn into a centaur. Only problem is he forgets to reattach a human half and takes off in his embarrassment. While everyone is mourning, I ponder just how much her crystal body would sell for, like any true hero would. Unfortunately, this kind of thinking is stopped when a magical boom boom occurs across the ocean, meaning I now have to get a bard to bless my boat so I may sail across it. Before I do that, it's time for some serious side questing. I show off my extraordinary sculpting skills, and on two separate occasions, help find some odd true love. One with a goblin, and one with blueprints for a bridge. Love comes in all forms, right? At this point, my combat strategy mainly consists of just snapping at my enemies, which made me feel super cool, and them feel very dead. I attempt to join the goblin resistance movement, despite the fact that the last quest involved murdering a bunch of goblins simply for their stink rags. Surprisingly, they didn't care about that at all, but I couldn't do the quest because it requires shooting a magical force field. 
Using a gun would ruin the challenge, and magic wouldn't count this time, so I have to leave the goblin lady there to stare forever at that wall. I head into the fungal wilds and come across a goblin dance crew. I dance with them for a time, though I become enthralled by the amazing moves of one of the goblins doing the worm and infinitely. When I finally manage to free myself, I run into Torque, the bard I need to bless my boat. Problem is, his bonking loot isn't working properly thanks to all the dark energy in the forest. I help him fight some skellies, but then having the attention span of a small chihuahua hyped up on a weak supply of caffeine, I get distracted by some small creatures called smurfs, I mean murfs, who I'm sure have nothing to do with smurfs. I help the murfs fight off the disgusting blue mutated murfs and even just sit there in acid while the blue murfs run to their deaths. At this point, I get distracted from my distraction and go back to helping Torque. Torque leads me to the next boss of the game, the Banshee. He doesn't prove much help, just sitting there, and I'm killed nearly right away by purple gas. This boss is especially tough as I cannot engage in melee with her without taking massive damage, so it comes down to a battle of attrition. This became one of the weirdest battles I've ever seen as all I could ever do to her was snap at her over and over again while dodging her very predictable moves. Finally, she dead, and in her place, I meet Fairy Punch Father, who fixes Torque's loot and sends him back to the city. I could go with, but I remember that those wonderful little Murphs probably still need my help. Last time I checked in, Murfetta had been kidnapped. Turns out Gargle Snot, their main enemy, was really taking his time, so I make it in time to save Murfetta, and with her help, I die to Gargle Snot. One of my more embarrassing deaths was to lose to that guy. I finish him off and Murfetta gives me a giant rocket launcher for my payment. While of course, I won't use it, does make me wonder why she never used that the entire fight really seemed like it could have come in handy. Arriving back in Brighthoof, I'm ready to set sail across the ocean and defeat the Dragon Lord. Torque decides to tweak my plans a bit by doing something unorthodox, blowing up the entire ocean. I don't know about anyone else, but I'm pretty sure destroying the entire ocean is like the worst thing a villain could do. So even if I defeat the Dragon Lord, everyone is doomed. But heck, now I can do a class as a Berserker to improve my melee abilities, so I guess the scale balances out, right? I head off into the now waterless seabed where I find a whole bunch of people. I mean, I headed out right after the ocean evaporated and yet there's already people down here handing out quests like this was a usual event. I find a magical being who asks for help getting to a better place, so of course, like a good neighbor, I help him. He then proceeds to destroy an entire town by turning into a massive beanstalk. So yeah, I may have caused another catastrophe, but heck, this has to be some kind of record with how fast I'm causing all these mass deaths by accident. Fairy Punch Father appears again and we team up to deal with the menaces on the beanstalk. Once again my attention span wanders and this time I go help a wizard with his errant apprentices. I have to shrink down to break into the house and this time I'm put up against the hardest boss in the game. A normal sized skeleton mage. Not the super foe I expected, but without my guns I can't keep him from healing repeatedly. Thankfully this is a side quest and I'm shameless so I have zero problem just running away. I come across the parasite on the beanstalk who has three freaking health bars. There are several smart tactics I could probably take. But I go with the dumb one of endlessly attacking, and even if I go down, I can easily pick myself back up with a death save off of one of the minions. By this time, I have a spell I'll never get enough of, a meteor shower that wipes out and continuously causes dark magic damage on the ground. The fact that this is my favorite spell, probably another sign that I don't belong in the hero business. It gets results though, and the parasite is defeated. I meet another skeleton pirate, but as a welcome surprise, Bones 3 Wood is a friendly one. Naturally, I get into a fight with some crabs and some sharks with legs, because Sure, why not? I repair Bones, Robo, Parrot, and collect his crew by fighting them, of course, as there's never another way to solve problems. No charisma rolls here. I learn about a tragic love story between him and another skeleton named Lachance. I help fight Lachance, reunite the tragic couple, finally doing something good. Three times now I've brought couples together, so I'm thinking I may suck at being a hero, but I'd be an excellent love guru. People would be together, just have to live in fear of the day I undoubtedly cause another disaster. I meet a snake lady, Kasara who wants to help me stop her former sisters from doing something. I'm sure it's important, but when I meet this crab with a pirate hat and sword, I forget all else to help him. He wants me to defeat some sirens that cursed him with intelligence, and I'm more than happy to oblige him. After that, I get back to helping Kisara with whatever she wants me to do. All I know is I have to burn this little fish as a sacrifice. Poor guy. Even after I blow his home up, I find a fish to burn at the stake. My character does not like sea life, it seems. Well, the fish doesn't feel lonely for long, as Kisara also goes up in flames spontaneously. Perhaps people should just not hang out around me. Seems bad for their health. Speaking of health, mine is about to go way down as I get into a fight with Drill, the dark sea god cosplaying as Batman's Bane. This big fella and death don't seem to get along because every time I kill him, he comes back. It takes three times to take the big boy down. 
With his death, I think that makes me the new god of the sea. What's left of it, anyways? I promise to be an awful and lackluster ruler as I don't want to let anyone down by having high expectations. To maintain a sense of variety, I now leave the seabed for the high cliff sides of Karnak's wall. I meet Wastard. A soup's powerful necromancer is actually one of the good guys and therefore is having a ton of issues. The largest one being he is currently separated from his body. The only problem is that this is one of the hardest places for my style of combat. Wyverns are everywhere and these jerks know my ultimate weakness. My short little arms. It takes a lot of dodging, waiting for spells to cool down, and landing in lucky melee shots as the dragons fly overhead. One thing I'm thankful for is if you do manage to get a couple melee shots in, the wyverns are actually very obliging and decide to land in order to beat you to death with their claws. This rarely works out for them except this one wyvern that sent me on a trip to heaven who didn't accept me and I plunged downwards to hell. I finally managed to make it to Waster's body. As the dragon lord also loves necromancy, of course that means Waster's body is the next boss battle. Waster really is the powerful necromancer he boasts about being and I have a long battle of spells and melee ahead of me. The really annoying thing about him is the spectral dragon that comes along to replenish his shield. I feel like this would be zero issues for me if I had a gun. My melee and spells love to auto-target Wastard instead of the dragon, which drives me a bit crazy, but I do manage to kill it. I finish him off, say sorry to Phantom Wastard for destroying his body, but I guess the perks of being a necromancer is they don't have to worry about small details, like a vaporized body because five feet away is his fully fleshed out body again. Before I leave the cliffs, I help Wastard get back together with his goth girlfriend, once again proving my character would make a fantastic matchmaker. At long last, I reach the Dragon Lord's lair. I do wonder if Torque hadn't blown up the ocean, this would have been much faster to get to. But less fun probably also, so I guess it balances out nicely. Further into the wasteland, I meet Cyclops. Cyclopsi? Cyclopses? I mean those big one-eyed dudes who I quickly decide while having a super cool design are the most annoying characters to fight in this game for me. They have tons of health, hit like, well, like a giant cyclops would, and when they die their eye detaches and causes problems from above, plus the eye knows how to dodge my spells. Getting past them, I come face to face with who I feel should have been the real big bad of the game. Queen butt stallion's head on an undead humanoid body. Nice and creepy. Nightmare, as she is called, is actually super easy to predict and avoid. It's the endless archers around her that are both the most difficult and most helpful part. Difficult because they keep shooting me like jerks, but helpful because I can get several death saves off of them. When I finally finish off her health, surprise, surprise, she has yet another health bar. Here I get one of the most last second death saves ever and manage to finish her off for good. With her death, I'm ready to go home, but I guess the game doesn't feel the same way about her as I do, so on I go. I learned about the Dragon Lord's tragic backstory, but I'm more focused on his talent for showmanship. Guy could have quite the future in wrestling. While I would love to go tickle his bones with my blade, I'm told I'm too low leveled still. So I head off to ruin more people's days. I find a nice peaceful group of snake ladies and promptly release an evil water goddess on them. Honestly, this whole game is me cleaning up my own mistakes. I guess that's one way to find trouble. Create it yourself. I meet Garrett of Trivia, the rudest monster hunter ever, who has me fully reform the evil water goddess so we can kill her again. It doesn't make much sense to me, but I'm really good at following orders even when I'm pretty sure it will get more people killed. Gotta get that XP after all. Things go predictably bad, but I do manage to kill the goddess and get cheered at by the few remaining locals left. They clearly do not realize who started this whole mess in the first place. After I retrieve the eye for a cyclops missing one, I am now high enough level to go fight the dragon lord. So in I charge, and for the most part, it's a breeze, till I get attacked by a badass cyclops and two skelly spellcasters. They actually cause me to have two full deaths until I manage to pick them off one by one. From here, I just run by all the enemies not bothering to kill them and make my way to where the dragon lord awaits. This is the easiest boss fight ever. At least that's what I thought at first. He's very predictable and doesn't know how to turn around much, so spells and melee work wonders. But then the crazy guy actually learns quickly, and his stage 2 is a nightmare. Which I'm glad about, because it'd be very anticlimactic if he proved to be the biggest pushover of all. Now, he has a nasty swirl poison attack which keeps me away from him for the most part, so very little melee could be done. Then when his shield goes down, he calls in a giant dragon, which finally! I have fought wyverns throughout the game, but this is the first proper dragon, which made me wonder, all game, why this guy was called the dragon lord and not the undead lord or something. Bernadette, the dragon, turns our big bad invincible till enough damage has been dealt her. This is difficult as she's out of range of my melee and I have to wait for my spells to cool down while I keep dodging the barrage of attacks from both her and her boss. I go down twice, but on the third attempt I learn to leave the minions alone, so if I go down I can death save off of them. After a long battle full of me running like crazy and screaming, please do not kill me, I manage to heroically win. Never in doubt. With the Dragon Lord at my mercy, I have officially beaten the story and most of the game, which is melee and magic. Huzzah! Most of the world is probably destroyed thanks to me trying to save it, but heck, 
Beggars can't be choosers. I hope you all enjoyed watching this challenge as much as I did doing it. I can firmly say guns would have been very useful, but it's more than doable even on the hardest difficulty to win without them. If you did enjoy, please feel free to leave a like and subscribe if you want to see more gaming challenges or if you like my other type of content. Have an amazing day, friends. See you soon.